Hello and welcome to Cinema to the Letter. This episode is that masterpiece known as Michael Clayton. Cinema to the Letter, we break down the very nature of cinema, letter by letter. For each episode of a film miniseries topic, we cover six films that fit a C for classic, I for indie, N for new, E for egregious, M for masterpiece, and A for atypical. Because who doesn't love an acronym, am I right? I am Thomas, and I have been coded in this patina of shit for the best part of my life. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, hello, I am Brian, and... Um... I think uh, Roman Conquest sounds like a really cool book. I would love to read whatever that whatever that book is that he's that he's got. I know, right? I mean, I want to read that whole series. I want to be like Tom Wilkins, just like tell me the name of the book again. Yeah, highlighting just random parts <laughs> with a giant highlight. <laughs> so good. Uh, but we're not the only ones here because uh, we do have a guest with us, Brian. Uh, he is the host of another great Talk Film Society podcast, Monsters Never Die, uh, and also a Michael Clayton super fan in his own right. Uh, Matt Curione. Matt, welcome to the show. Guys, you gotta try this bread. Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> you know it. The bread looks so good. <laughs> that bread looks amazing. We all bought, like, a giant thing of baguettes right after we watched this, like, immediately. <laughs> of course. Right. You can't not. <laughs> oh, Michael. Dear Michael. Dear sweet Michael. <laughs> So, uh, Matt, I invited you on, um, mainly because I knew you had uh, said, I believe, in a previous Talk Film Society podcast that uh, this was one of your favorite movies. Without a doubt. Top five all time. Right. And uh, to the degree, if you check Matt on Letterboxd, uh, you can see that he's logged at, what, 10 times? 11 now, I guess, with our show? Pro about that. Maybe 12, because I watched it again today. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Twice in 24 hours. <laughs> Why don't you tell us your history with Michael Clayton? When did you first see it, and what really like made you glom onto it? Uh, I first saw this probably about a week after it came out. Uh, me and my buddy Johnny, uh, who actually I'll talk more about him later. We have a podcast in the works. Uh, we were like, we were bored, and we decided to go to the movies. And we both liked George Clooney. We knew nothing about this movie going in. Uh, we were like, eh, maybe it'll be good, maybe it won't, who knows. It'll be interesting. We walked out, blown away. We were speechless. We were like, that's... That's a movie. That was a nice surprise. And then uh, over the years, it just has become a, uh, a comfort watch, a personal favorite. Uh, it's my favorite movie that came out that year. I uh, ride or die for Michael Clayton, guys. <laughs> you know, we, we need more people in that army, I suppose. And you were there from nearly day one. Yeah. Which we appreciate. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Knew nothing about it. I just knew it's supposed to be good and George Clooney's in it. That was enough for me. <laughs> Well, it is interesting because this was a movie that uh, I hadn't seen until a couple years ago when I was working okay. on a, t a Tilda Swinton kick, which obviously yes. was important to this particular episode. But um, I had heard about it for so long as like, oh, this is a great movie, especially from like that Oscar season was around the time I started getting into the Oscars, mm -hmm. like Die Hard, like right. what, making sure I saw uh, There Will Be Blood and uh, No Country for Old Men. I saw that had like a double feature where they were nice. the same time this came out. The double feature. Night. Yes. Uh, but... Yeah, I, this one slipped by me, uh, even though I came to love a lot of the people in this, especially, like, you know, we'll, we'll talk about him, the recently dearly departed Tom Wilkinson, um, became, became, like, one of my favorite actors, but it was weird that I hadn't seen this movie until around that time of, like, I was doing that Tilda Swinton kick, and, uh, yeah, it really, truly lived up to all the hype I'd heard about it, but, uh, Brian, you have a similar thing where you hadn't seen it until fairly recently, right? I'm gonna be honest, I, as much as I do love George Clooney, um, which w we can kind of get into that in a little bit, but I hadn't really heard of this movie. And I think like there was kind of this wave, I think a few years ago of like people just kind of being like Michael Clayton is actually a masterpiece and kind of mm -hmm. reassessing it and kind of like, you know, um, and I decided to watch it and kind of like you, Matt, I, I didn't know anything about what it was about other than yeah. George Clooney was in it. 
And it's and such it a was... hard movie to describe to people and like sell yeah. them on. Like yeah. I was watching tonight with my coworker and she's like, oh, my sister was asking what we're doing. We're watching a movie. And I said, it's Michael Clayton. She didn't know what it was. And she said, oh, it's about a lawyer and pesticides and <laughs> bad things happening. And this movie's really hard to sell. It is. And like, even after I had seen it, I was like, okay, this wasn't what I was expecting in any yeah. way. And I, I loved it because it, it, it's incredibly well made and incredibly compelling and just so watchable but um yeah I, I didn't really know what to make of it almost because it is such a you know yeah it fits into like the legal thriller kind of genre but it doesn't i don't know it's it more feels than a, that yeah it, it is so much more than that it had so much other themes in it and re-watching it for this i was just kind of really blown away by how good this movie was and just you know remembering it like oh right this is where this this thing heads and it's it's such a great movie yeah on paper like in describing it like matt was talking about it kind of feels like it would be forgettable oscar bait from around this time like it would be more in the yeah. camp of say in the valley of Ela, which tommy lee jones was nominated for this same year the kind of thing where it's like a movie lost to time <laughs> i vaguely remember that movie coming out right exactly that's, that's the thing like it feels on paper especially with it like such a boring name of michael clayton yeah who just so? some guy just some guy <laughs> some guy <laughs> Right, exactly. Um, but yeah, I think it just really exemplifies, especially, you know, we should, we should talk about sort of the reason we're covering it here is it's uh, for our one one Oscar season. And this obviously won, it's one Oscar for Tilda Swinton, uh, which I remember being a surprise around the time of that Oscars. Like everyone was kind of like shocked by yeah. it. Um, and it's an amazing performance from her. We'll talk about it in a bit more detail. Um, but it is curious... How, like, this one was also, like, the only one nominated for multiple acting awards for this. Wilkins board, was yeah. nominated, and Clooney was nominated, and it got, like, its, you know, best uh, picture nomination, all sorts of great stuff like that. But made $93 million at the time, and it kind of, I think, faded for a bit. But like Ryan's talking about, I think it's really gained a new life. And how do you, why do you think that is, Matt? What do you think, like, makes this kind of, like, last? Uh, the reason I think people keep rediscovering it is because it keeps showing up on streaming services every once in a while, honestly. It's true. And but, they yeah. so they and they see George Clooney's big face on the little icon. They're like, I like that guy. He's pretty good. I'll check that out. <laughs> I mean, this movie, I can't even explain it. It's just like this special thing that they don't make them like this anymore. And I hate that phrase, but they really don't. And people are just pining for, like, what they used to have. And you see a movie like this with powerhouse performances throughout, and you're like, yeah, no, this is good. This is this is a movie. <laughs> right. The, the streaming thing you mentioned, I think, is very apt because, like, when I was watching it this time in particular, I was just like, man, it's a real shame this came at, like, kind of the end of Cable because it's yeah. kind of like the perfect Cable. Oh, movie. yeah. The perfect movie. <laughs> like, oh, Michael Clayton's on. I'll fucking watch it. <laughs> oh, this is on TNT again? Awesome. Put it on. <laughs> right. Exactly, but now the TNT is like, oh, it's on Netflix here, and like you're mentioning, it's just exactly. George Clooney's face just yeah. really tracks people. Do you think that's accurate, Brian? Yeah, and I mean, like, I, I, it definitely feels like a movie I would have watched on cable and just kind of been like, even if I had not understood what was going on in the movie, like, when I was younger and when I would put stuff on on cable, I... I, I wouldn't often understand it. Like, this movie's about, like like you said, like, pesticides and yeah, cor like corporations what? and, you know, lawyers and stuff like that. But, like, yeah, it feels like a cable movie. But also, I think, like, you made an interesting point, Matt, is that, like, it stars George Clooney. Yeah. And I think, like, Clooney, at least, I, I'm, I'm very curious to get your guys' perspective on him. But for me, at least, he was always one of those actors who could just sell any movie. Yep. Right. Like George Clooney's in it. American audience w audiences will just flock to it, and he's one of those like just big like A list movie stars. And I mean, th this is some of his best work, which I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about. But um, mm -hmm. I, I I think Clooney really like you know th there's lots of talk of kind of you know the the death of the movie star and kind of I, he also feels like one of these last few. He's like one of the only huge few, yeah. movie stars, I think. Um, and even now, he's like gone behind the camera for the most part. And well, <laughs> he's not really a movie star anymore. I mean, it sucks. No, <laughs> this comes at a very interesting point in his career because this is after like Good Night and Good Luck when he had gotten like a, there a bunch of nominations for that, and he'd also won for Syriana, almost as like a makeup. Like you did so great, George. We all love yeah. your your directorial career and that you're going on now. 
and I think sadly his career kind of like takes a bit more of like a swing after this point because then mm-hmm. when he as he starts to get more into directing, I think he starts to kind of falter sadly, and then like, yeah. I think with the like you're mentioning the the end of the movie star era, it feels like he kind of felt lost after a certain yeah. point. I mean, he did this, and then years later he did The Descendants, and that was like his last big hurrah as like the leading man. That's true, and even when he's in a massive yeah. success after that, it's like Gravity, where it's the Sandra Bullock yeah. show, but Clooney's just a exactly, ride. exactly. Yeah. And even like in Gravity, though, his presence feels like almost almost like a a glorified cameo almost like yeah, I get you that. know yeah. like you know they're bringing him in and to do his like bit right to be charming and funny and kind of do that whole thing um yeah it kind of feels like the end of his kind of big run at least but like in the 2000s i i think at least like i, I was kind of going through his career in the 2000s and just how much i i love him mainly through like the like two kind of director directors i guess three but you know steven soderbergh and the coen brothers Mm -hmm. and just how like great he is in like oh brother where art thou in the oceans movies and like i love solaris uh and just like (laughs) out of sight as well which i i think out of sight is maybe my favorite cloning performance nice and i'm curious like what your guys is if it is michael clayton or if it is something else i mean it's hard to argue with clayton it's hard to argue with like danny ocean Honestly, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But I mean, I would even go far as as far back as something like From Dust Till Dawn. I think is underrated in terms of just like it's such a great use of him, just coming in and immediately like adding a bit more gravitas to like, especially once it goes all vampire-y. Yeah. And it's like, look, I fucking saw some vampires, man. That's what I'm gonna shoot. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna do. Uh, you can see it even in those earlier points, or even all the way back if you want to go to like Facts of Life and ER and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, personally, it is Michael Clayton for me. I, I don't think he's ever been better. I even like his silent scenes, like the ending credits. My God, yeah, that, that is that is a that is some powerhouse silent acting, and he pulls it off better than most. It's if nothing else, I think one of the best weaponizations of his particular movie star persona. Mm-hmm. He's got those sorrowful eyes. Yes. And they just, ah, God, they connect so well. Yeah, and it's especially interesting as we'll get into it and we'll talk about how he wasn't the first choice for the role. It's mm-hmm. kind of fascinating. Uh, the only other person who I think could have probably done it <laughs> was the first choice. But <laughs> let's go ahead and just play our clip from the trailer here for Michael Clayton. Michael, thank God. Look, I, I, I got a situation. Michael! Arthur Edens just stripped down naked in a deposition room in Milwaukee. You are the senior litigating partner of one of the largest, most respected law firms in the world. You are a legend. I'm an accomplice! You're a manic depressive. I am Shiva, the god of death. I'm Michael Clayton. You're late. This is a $3 billion class action lawsuit. The architect of our defense has been arrested for running naked through a parking lot. He's building the case against you, North. Nobody's going to let him do that. Let him? Who the hell's going to stop him? I spent 12% of my life defending the reputation of a deadly weed killer. Arthur. No way. They killed the Michael. I'm not the enemy. Then who are you? Freeze! I'm not the guy that you kill. I'm the guy that you buy. Are you so blind you don't even see what I am? Do I look like I'm negotiating? So Michael Clayton uh, came out on October 5th, 2007, from director-writer Tony Gilroy. Um, and uh, as we mentioned, it uh, won a Best Supporting Actress Oscar for Tilda Swinton, but it was also nominated for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Original Screenplay, uh, Best Actor for Clooney, Best Supporting Actor for Tom Wilkinson, and a Best Original Score, which that was another thing coming back to it this time. The score is so great. James Newton Howard. The score is great, and I remember people were pissed when it was nominated. Really? People were angry. They're like, that music's nothing. Blah, 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 blah. No, it's actually really damn good. Uh, whenever I go to the go to New York City, I put that on my headphones. <laughs> and it just sounds perfect walking through the streets. 
Yeah, I mean, I get that. Especially, like, even right from the opening. The combination of Wilkinson's monologue oh, and then so that good. score is, like, fucking perfect. I guess to start off here, um, you know, in terms of the what we were talking about earlier, like, Clooney ends up getting this role. Um, but it was originally offered to Denzel Washington, Oof. who, like, flatly turned it down because he was skeptical about working with Tony Gilroy, who at this, this time had been a very accomplished screenwriter, but this is his first directorial effort. Yeah. And uh, Washington regretted that later. As well he should have. <laughs> so he's the only other one who I think could have possibly done something anywhere close yeah. to what Clooney's doing here. But at the same yeah. time, I also can't imagine anyone else but Clooney as Michael Clayton. Yeah, because a lot like Clooney, Washington has those those eyes. Everything's in the eyes with him. Yes. And also I think has the same kind of commanding presence, mm-hmm. like like on the on the screen, as it were, like that Clooney has, like... You know, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I could have seen Denzel do this, and he does kind of do a, a similar version of this with, like, Roman J. Israel, kind of, also working with another Gilroy. Right. Um, yes. I remember that movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking about that movie a lot, actually. I, I, I have no idea why. I remember kind of it being fine, but um, it's a great Denzel performance, I, I'll, I'll say that much. Yes, where at that point also Denzel was firmly in his, like, he's taken over the Jack Nicholson role of, like, you'll nominate me, fine, I don't know why. <laughs> right, I was exactly. sitting up here up front, <laughs> but fine. Fine, I'll do it, whatever. <laughs> like, in front row seats, everything's great. Yeah. You know, we mentioned here, uh, it's the first film from Tony Gilroy, and Tony Gilroy is an interesting career to kind of follow, where he was a working screenwriter throughout the 90s. I watched recently his debut of The Cutting Edge, which is a romance between uh, an ice skater and a hockey player. And okay. it sounds kind of like lame on paper, but in practice, it's like <laughs> the most functional version of that script possible. Yeah, And I think that's the thing with him, is that even in like when he's hired to do like weird trash, he'll still make something incredibly functional. Uh, but then he kind of got a bit more of like a career bump with the Bourne trilogy, which he wrote. And mm-hmm. this comes out, like, the fall after The Bourne Ultimatum. So I think he's kind of riding off of that. And uh, what do you think of Gilroy's work in general, Matt? Are you a fan? Uh, I honestly haven't seen much of hmm. of his of his stuff. I mean, I've seen uh, seen the Bourne movies, obviously. I've seen... Uh, didn't he ghost direct Rogue One? I saw that. Yes, and he also has a, a writing credit on it because he ghost okay. directed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so that. <laughs> um, yeah, that, Michael Clayton... Uh, not much else, honestly. I haven't seen his new Star Wars show yet, so... Oh, man. The, this is, says it's great. It, it is, like, incredible. I, I think, like, the films he's directed are very interesting, right? Because it's, it's, it's Michael Clayton, Duplicity, yes. and then The Bourne Legacy. And it, it is so interesting, I think, looking at his career from, like, the movies he's directed, because I think... There is definitely a through line there. Uh, like Thomas, we were kind of talking about this, like thematically, the kind of ideas he's interested in of like corporate espionage, mm-hmm. just kind of like, I don't know, his approach to it is just so fascinating. And we'll, we'll kind of talk about it a bit more in, in regards to Michael Clayton, but like him bringing a lot of those ideas into a Star Wars is, it makes me so happy. And I... It sounds I, pretty I, cool, honestly. Stellan Skarsgård gets some, like, Tom Wilkinson-level monologues. Yes. In yes. some of the episodes. You've that sold like, me. Fuck yeah. You have sold me. <laughs> Why did anyone yes. say that before? That's the first thing I mentioned. <laughs> but also just, like, uh, all the ideas of just, like, corruption and just, like, just, you know, people and corporations. Just these, like, evil motherfuckers, right? And just like, corporate, you know, corporate America or corporate, you know, in the empire or whatever. I think just all of those themes and all those ideas are, are just really interesting in the way that he approaches them. And even in born legacy, which I I rewatched and I think is good actually. Um, Now, which one's that? That's the one with Renner, right? Yes. That's the one with Renner. I like that one. Yeah. (laughs) That was a cool movie. (laughs) It is a cool movie. Yeah. I I think that movie, the, the worst elements of it, I think are where it tries to like, really remind you that it's a Bourne movie and so mm-hmm. it kind of like really like it just shows a picture of like Jason Bourne on a TV for like <laughs> like, like 20 seconds just to be like hey you get it 
it's Jason Bourne. It's, it's connected, remember? Yeah, right. yeah. And, and they that's... wheel out Albert Finney for like an afternoon <laughs> to shoot one yeah. scene, shit like that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. A lot of that movie is is so fascinating. I think it's it's directed very well. Um, I think a bit a lot of it is kind of edited to to shit in a lot of ways. Like I I don't. No offense to to John Gilroy, the the third Gilroy sibling, but um, <sighs> so many Gilroys. I know. <laughs> um. But yeah, no, Born Legacy, good actually. Much better than Jason Bourne. Oh, I will give it. That was the last one, right? That was the last one. Yeah, that was all right. It was fine. It was action. Was, action was cool, but like whatever. <laughs> right. Uh, but but anyway, yeah. So uh, I think he is fascinating. I agree with what you were talking about, Brian. Because like when you watch, especially like uh, the two directorial efforts, uh, Duplicity and Born Legacy. There is a lot about sort of not just like corporate espionage, but even like the sort of complex webs that people yeah. weave kind of deal. It's a lot of just like, you know, all of his movies wouldn't be out of character if like Charlie Day showed up with like the fucking yarn thing. <laughs> and so like there's a bit of like that conspiracy. <laughs> Tom Wilkinson gets to that point <laughs> oh, yeah. at certain bits of this. Yeah, but I think that's what's that's really fascinating is that like he really knows how to like weave like a big sort of like complex story and usually deliver on it. Like, even with a duplicity, which I also watched in prep for this, I think that's a, an interesting movie. I like that movie, especially like Clive Owen and Julia Roberts play off each other so well. But that's yeah. one where it almost feels like it gets too convoluted, like, after a certain point. Um, even though there's still fun stuff, like the opening credit scene with Wilkinson and Paul Giamatti, like, yes. screaming at each other is amazing. <laughs> so he kicks him in the shit, and it's just, <laughs> yes. yeah, it's so funny. I should watch this movie. <laughs> it's a good movie. It's it's pretty good actually. Yeah, it's it's a great kind of yeah corporate espionage. Clive Owen, Julia show. Roberts. Okay, cool. I mean, he he really does like to weave these really kind of dense, intricate, complex plots, and you know, at least for me, at least rewatching like Born Legacy and everything, I was like so confused for the first like forty five minutes, <laughs> and kind of the same with Duplicity in a way of just you're just like. Okay, I'm I'm kind of following along. This is like I love these actors. It, it's it, it's very good writing, but like, uh, you know, duplicity especially is like so convoluted to the point where I think like it, it it definitely needed some kind of organizational kind of stuff going on there. But at the same time, that interplay between like Owen and Roberts is like so perfectly like written. Yes. It's like really good comedy banter that also works as like intriguing like between these two characters and so even when i'm like yeah i don't know what the plot's on about but like these two very pretty people <laughs> right <laughs> very good together <laughs> yes. always a bonus <laughs> yes and like and and michael clayton is kind of like that right like uh, me watching this movie for the first time which like when i rewatched it i forgot how this movie just starts at like a hundred miles an hour with like wilkinson delivering that monologue yeah. and like yeah. all these shots of like corporate offices and new york and everything i'm it, it's incredibly compelling and yet at least the first time i watched it i was kind of like lost of like what is what is happening what is this movie about like i just any preconception i had of what this movie was when i first watched it just went out the window because it is i, I don't know he he's he navigates it very well but it is initially very dense and complex he doesn't explain a lot of things you kind of infer a lot of it through just watching it and stuff, yeah. and stuff like that which i think is one of the things that makes him a, a really good writer actually i think he's a he's a really great writer particularly of like really giving us exposition with just human interaction i think he does such right. a great job yeah. with that like you get a sense fully of like the, the first scene with Clooney and wilkinson you instantly get like former mentor this guy means a lot to him, and he's really disappointed yeah. that, like, this is happening. Like, you get so much of it through just, like, the interaction between those two characters, which works at the same time for, like, the opening, where, like, Wilkinson is, like, going on on this, like, insane rant, and all of this, like, shit is just, like, literally pr someone pushing a cart in an office building, but that yeah. music is, like, this is the most <laughs> dire thing possible. Yes. Um, and it's, like, you're immediately, like, sucked in, even to the degree, like, as he's talking about, like, his patina of shit. Like I was joking about earlier and all this other stuff. You don't care because like it's so well written and so well delivered. Like who cares? This is fucking immediately putting me on the edge of my seat at minute two. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> and then you get to uh, then the camera just pans over to Sidney Pollock and everything's great. Oh man, yeah. Underrated actor. Yes, underrated. Absolutely. Yes, very very solid actor. Especially like he could just come in for a scene like in Death Becomes yeah. Her. 
Yes. He's just like the doctor for like a scene. <laughs> and it's just like perfect use of him. He's so funny in that movie. Yes. But God, I love him. I love him in this. I think he's just just terrific. I quote him a lot, actually. Uh, when'd you get so fucking delicate? <laughs> so good or even just like the actual introduction with this great shot of like, like yeah. the war room going on and like the one guy's like on the phone with the reporter and then he goes over to Pollock and I love how Pollock initially gives like a BS answer just like a neutral like oh whatever. yeah at this time we're still settling and then it's like oh that's bullshit come on and then he just like really lays it into her and then hangs up trying to get something to print or trying to avoid uh, print no retraction pick one <laughs> right yes exactly also <laughs> we should mention with this phone thing Maybe the best mid two thousands cell phone movie ever with like the flip yes. phones, Nokia yep. phones, the Blackberries. Mm-hmm. Yes, the Blackberries. Right when iPhone was about to hit, and yes. yeah, this was like the last gasp for the Flipposaurus Rex. <laughs> I think of this and the Departed in particular. It's like great yes. movies oh, where people yes. just flip open yeah. flip phones, <laughs> and it's so perfect. Real quick, that scene in the Departed where he texts in his pocket. Yes, I oh, I, I, yes. I feel seen. I used to be able to do that shit. <laughs> I was like, that was a skill we had back in the day. Yeah, now if you try and do that, your phone's just like, face ID? Yeah, you what do you want? What do you want from me? Siri? Call 911? You want to talk to Siri? <laughs> yeah. Siri's just yelling at you, and they all know you have a phone on you now. You're in trouble. No microprocessors for you. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I, I kind of on the, the Sidney Pollock, of, uh, since we're on him, because I'm not as familiar with other movies he's acted in or movies he's directed necessarily but like we've all seen eyes wide shut and i think great in that but and also like i think this movie really kind of taps into that sort of energy with him of how kind of scary he can be right Mm -hmm. he's very imposing and also he just plays in like i don't know just something about him maybe it's just the way he looks and the way he you know carries himself he's very commanding he matches so well of just that idea of like these corporate like rich assholes mm-hmm. who are like at mm-hmm. the very top and are so morally bankrupt and he just he nails that and especially like i think the scene with clooney that you were you were, you were quoting like <laughs> it is a perfect scene because clooney is com- is commanding in his own right yeah but, but then I think, pollock just takes him exactly down. he's yeah. like and what if you're not as good as you remember because i've seen <sighs> that happen Man. Oof. yeah Oof. It, it, it's i don't know there, it, he just really nails that role and i think like it, it, it goes like so toe-to-toe with clooney and like just absolutely bonds yeah. him in that scene yeah he does. <laughs> which i yeah I, I i love him he's great in this movie i think with pollock what i lo- always liked about him was just the fact that like if you go even as far back as like a tootsie or you go to something like this but one of his more recent movies you do get a real sense of just like not only that he has that authority, but also he's not, like, trying to be a George Clooney movie star. He's just like, no, I have all this power. Like, I'm not going to bother yeah. looking like George Clooney. And that's fine. Yeah. I don't need to. <laughs> no. like, he's, like, he's frumpy in a way, and he's, like, he's aged into truly just, yeah. like, this guy who's, like, look, I, my, my authority here is mainly just because, like, I'm tired. I should have <laughs> gone to bed. It's past, like, yeah. 9 p.m. I don't know why I'm up right now. <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> And that really contrasts, like you mentioned, like perfectly off Clooney, um, who at the same time, like I, what I like about him in this role was the fact that despite that he's like this fixer who's like has such a reputation, all this other stuff, he that scene where he talks with Pog about just like, look, I'm fucking broke and yeah. I'm not actually doing that great. Like when you see his home life, it's like, oh, this fixer guy is completely alone and doesn't have really anybody except his son who he sees occasionally. That's his the kid, only person yeah. he really interacts with. Yeah. Who is great. I, I love that relationship. That kid is great. That kid is great, yeah. Like, like, I I love that performance. And especially that that one scene where he's in the car with Clooney and he's like, you know, even on his best day, you're stronger than him. Talking about the the shithead uncle. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, that's a great, great scene. And the kid, like, his reactions just sell it. Like, that's how you would react if your dad was talking to you like this. He feels like an actual kid. Uh, we should make yeah. Sean Cullen yeah. is the actor's name. He didn't do a lot after this, which is a shame. I do agree. That it's is a, a shame. Kid performance. Yeah. yeah. But I think that that scene that you talked about, Matt, like specifically, I think shows a lot of what Clooney does really well in this movie mm-hmm. because he's, he, he gives that whole monologue and he does many monologues in this movie, but like 
he is so compelling. He is. Especially in that scene where you can see him building up to it. Like, yes. he's driving down the road and he's just like, he's, and he's trying to and hold and it he's back. Thinking, and then he just like parks the car. And what lets it go is the kid just going, what? <laughs> yeah. And I think like, I don't know. It is just like, obviously he's a great performer and he's very handsome and all, all those things. But I think like there is something that, that it's very hard to quantify, but like he just exudes movie star energy mm-hmm. where you just want to watch him on screen. Like he's such a compelling actor and I, I don't know. Like I, I love him in this. I, I kind of love like dejected Clooney a bit. Like I, yes. I love him in Solaris. I love him in um, same. I just watched the American, which is a, is a good oh, movie, but I think good. he's, he's very good in it. And I think yes. he really sells yes. a lot of that movie, but yeah, he, I just, I love him in this mode specifically. I think he's just great. Yes. <laughs> It feels definitely like him kind of starting to really, like, actually show his age, I think, Mm -hmm. in terms of a star persona, which I think really works, especially that, like, salt and pepper kind of look he, like, starts off with in this movie is, like, perfect, like, the the great evolution. But also, I think, while we're on that stuff with the car, just a big shout out, whether he's in the back seat or the front seat, great car (laughs) acting from Clooney in this movie. Fantastic. (laughs) Fantastic. Particularly with, like, the sort of data technology element of it, when he is, like, looking at his fucking GPS that's built in to his shitty car yeah. and then yeah. just like bashes it because it's not working it's just like yeah yes that, that feels believable 100 and that whole time you're like don't hit it too hard what are you doing right <laughs> yes <laughs> stop well, that I, rewatching this movie i forgot that it has this like in medias res like beginning right because it starts kind of on mm-hmm. with like tilda swinton in the bathroom like sweating and like him in the car and it's such an effect i, I usually kind of struggle with uh beginnings like that because I don't know. It can feel kind of hokey. It can feel kind of gimmicky, but like it works so well. Cause it works here. I- I'm kind of forgetting like, Oh, why is his GP? And then by the time you get to it, you're just like, you're Oh like, my oh. fucking God. Like he like, yeah, it- it's such a, great... why is he slamming his dashboard? Yeah. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I don't know. Just the way that this movie weaves around that kind of introduction and gets back to it, I think is so smart and so, I don't know, it just really works and especially ties it together at the end of, of kind of where you end up when you kind of know everything, you know what the horse means and you, you know, the car exploding and all that stuff. Yeah, it, it's just a great kind of introduction to this movie. And also, it's like you mentioned, it's like a great seed to like let lay there for the whole movie until mm-hmm, we right. get to like, it's right when the guy is like, you know, um, the guys who are following him are like talking with each other like over other uh, walkie talkies and you see him going back up to the car. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh fuck yes, we had to make we had to have that specific shot so we could really emphasize the fact like later on like perfectly like match it and I think that's like a, shows like even from the start of his directorial career, Gilroy just like had he knows it. what's up. But but yeah, so I guess let's talk a bit more about Tilda. We haven't mentioned much about her uh, besides that she won her Oscar for this, and it's wonderful fascinating performance, <laughs> wonderful performance, and weirdly not weird. Yeah, yeah for very for Tilda Swinton, this is a very normal performance. Like if you see her before this and after this, you're like, Really? She had that in her? All right. Good for her. <laughs> right. And especially just the fact that she's playing like the highest board literal Karen possible. Yes. And she exudes literal that Karen. energy. Yes. <laughs> Perfectly. Yes. <laughs> Karen's before they were a Karen. Uh before they were a thing. Uh yeah, no, she's great in this. I love the way Gilroy cuts it together where her, you know, practicing her speeches, getting ready, and everything is intercut, and then they just cut to the meeting. And it's just, it's so well done. It's like, oh yes, she would be a very well-rehearsed person. I mean, you're representing one of the biggest companies on Earth. You're going to have to practice. And uh, I, I especially love the little little line about work-life balance, and she just kind of laughs it off, and she's like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> That's not a thing. Don't be silly. <laughs> I mean, I got this, Don. Don't worry. <laughs> One of the things I think is so great about her performance in this is that, like, she's essentially, like, you know, you have these kind of movies about, like, corporate espionage, just mm-hmm. kind of, you know, kind of the, the inner workings of these corporations and, like, their shady dealings and all of that stuff. And, like, she's essentially the, the kind of puppet master of it all, right? Yeah. Like, she's kind of the one running it. And, I love how kind of against type it is. Like, usually, like, 
I don't know, usually you get to the end of that and it's like a Tom Wilkinson kind of kind of guy who's like exactly. gravelly and the stuff, but she is so like controlled and like measured and and incredibly evil, but just like not putting that on in any way, right? Like she, she orders is two so... people killed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like a car bomb like, too. Yes. Like, what? <laughs> like insane, insanely evil. Yeah, and I think that but that's part of I think what he's uh, Tony Giller is kind of getting at of the like these are the people who are like really evil like in our mm-hmm. society right like these yeah. are like the people they're not like these kind of mustache twirling villains they're the people <laughs> running the corporations who are like yeah. putting up a front of being like measured and like you know when she says like thank you to to uh Don for bringing me into the the U North family I'm just like yeah. oh my god like ugh. Ugh. Right, no, but I, I also like out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> I also like the fact that it feels truly like a performance where Tilda, like the whole time, is like playing at someone who was putting on a front perfectly. Yeah. That sequence yeah. we're talking about, where it's just like the rehearsal cut back with that in the interview, like does such a great job of emphasizing. Like it's such great, like just good enough acting to cover your ass mm-hmm. basically for yeah. all your nervousness and especially like that opening shot i think weirdly won her the oscar where she's just in that oh, fucking yeah. stall and she you just see her like sweaty pits Ugh. And immediately just like <laughs> okay our, our our main villain who we're gonna see later we have to remember like oh yeah we were introduced to her as like someone who can't kid it together <laughs> at <Yeah>. all <laughs> i i love her though i love tilda like in anything i love her you know in her kind of weirder performances where she's like you know in like okja for instance where she's just like yes. insane or whatever i um, like her as uh the angel gabriel <laughs> yes constantine she's great yes. in that too but like she she is this kind of cha- chameleonic chameleonic Chame- is that, that, that yeah right? yeah that works yeah um, i'll go with that, that sounds right that sounds right <laughs> <laughs> she she is th- that kind of actor though and she really morphs you know her persona and kind of how she looks and all this stuff and like um I, I i still am thinking of david fincher calling her you know saying she looks like a q-tip in in the killer earlier <laughs> the last year which is great <laughs> but like but she she's just such an interesting like she has a distinct look yeah but she is so compelling i think what the greatest scene in this entire movie is like the scene at the end um and just all of that is on her face and just her yes. eye movements and just the way she's like shuddering when she kind of realizes like what's happening there. And, and you just... can see her like turning things over in her mind. She's like, where's this going? Where's, okay, I got this. I got this. Right. Just pay the man. Just pay and... the man. Everything's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but in just the way that the, the kind of like the, the dynamics are shifting, right? Where she initially is like shocked and then she thinks she has the edge over him where she's kind of like, oh, that paper is nothing. It means nothing. And then just, I don't know, the way that it kind of goes back and forth during that scene. I, I think that's like, you say like the, the, the her intro is where she kind of won the Oscar. The I think that scene at the end is kind of where like there's it's someone the in the, yeah, there's someone in the wings just like with an Oscar, just ready to like hand it over to them because it's <laughs> such an incredible performance. Um, They've been waiting there the whole runtime, I would argue, Brian. Yeah. They just had it on yeah. standby, <laughs> waiting um but and but no cut. congratulations yeah. <laughs> you, you don't know this but when she actually accepted that was her like getting off the set of michael Clayton. yes yeah <laughs> it's obviously like such a like a role that lacks any kind of like ego whatsoever yeah. which is a big like bonus for her in general which is like yeah i'll put on weird makeup or whatever or yeah, in this case yeah. yeah i'll have like really bad pit sweats and yeah. like have the most mm-hmm. awkward like nervous nelly kind of expression the entire movie uh but still just like make it work like in that final scene like you're mentioning ryan it it does such a great job of like you see her face deteriorate crucially like you could watch that scene silently and just know like this lady's fucked i have no idea of the context of it but she's just fucked it's so good i was watching it with my coworker today and the whole time during that final scene she's like oh my god oh my oh my oh what 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 (laughs) It, it it is such an incredible final scene. I, I literally like when I finished it, like uh, not too long ago today, like I realized I had time and I was like, ah, let me just rewind it just to yeah, feel something. Yeah. Like it's just, <laughs> let's rewind that. Let's watch that again. That was really good. Just, uh, just their back and forth is, is so incredible. And like a funny thing I, I kind of couldn't help but think during this movie is I, um, I recently uh, rewatched burn after reading, which mm. in that movie, George Clooney and Tilda Swinton are like having an affair. 
yes. right. the whole time, which I, I just thought yes. was a really funny connection to this movie, <laughs> where they're like mortal enemies. and <laughs> <laughs> We got to go back to him. We've referenced him a lot, but let, let's focus a bit more on the late great Tom Wilkinson. Oh, uh, hello. With this performance. I mean, we talked about him a bit recently because we also did Eternal Sunshine earlier this season. Yeah. Um, what, Matt, when do you remember first seeing Wilkinson? Jesus. Um, first time I actually noticed him was either Batman Begins or John Adams. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, One of those? John Adams. <laughs> He's fantastic in John Adams as Ben Franklin. Holy shit. He's a lot of fun in that movie, in that in that show. Uh, but yeah, either that or Batman Begins. Uh, he was in some movie in the 90s that my mom watched all the time. It was a British movie. Wait, he was in The Full Monty, wasn't he? He was in The Full Monty, yes. That's it. There you go. That's the one. Wow, I'm an idiot. Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway, yeah, sure. The Full Monty, John Adams, and Batman Begins with his fantastic Gotham, New York accent, whatever. <laughs> The, the only accent that I want out of, like, British performers, like, I don't want your perfect American accent. I want no, your, don't give it's kind of American, but, like, what dialect yeah. is it? What? Yeah. <laughs> no. Where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, uh, he's great, and since then, I mean, he's been one of my, since this movie especially, one of my favorite actors. I just, I love Tom Wilkinson. Like, you can't go wrong with him. No, truly. Admittingly, yeah. even with, like, you know, when Batman Begins, that was probably the first time I also noticed him. And he is playing, like, a cartoon gangster man in that movie. Yeah, he's playing a comic book villain. And <laughs> then he nails it. <laughs> right. Exactly. He nails it, like, so wonderfully. And I think it's because, like, he's definitely one of those great character actors where he took whatever material and did whatever he could with it. Even when mm-hmm. he had to be in stuff like The Lone Ranger, you know, um, or <laughs> shit, he uh, wasn't that <laughs> right. Um, or like, you know, like Snowden and shit like that, where it's just like he, it never felt like it was, you know, from lack of effort from him. Yeah, no, he, those movies suffered. Yeah, he went for it, he was pretty good. <laughs> uh, what about you, Brian? What's your relationship with Wilkinson? I, I, I love him, I think he's he's great. He's a great kind of like, at least when I was growing up, like that guy, you know, kind of like, oh, I, I recognize him, he's mm-hmm. always, you know, he's yeah, but I. I think, like, yeah, Batman Begins is probably the first movie I saw him in, and he's so memorable in that, like, instantly. I think, he, you know, he just is so menacing and so imposing, and, like, he also has a very distinctive look, I think, um, to the point where, like, again, when he shows up in, like, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, like, I think he, yeah. he has, like, one scene, but I think a thing he does really well is giving a scene, even if he's only in, like, a little bit of a movie, he adds so much gravitas to it and you remember so much weight to him yeah you remember him and he sticks with you and he just like yeah i I love him um i recently saw like um in the bedroom the the todd fields movie which he is really great in he's a incredible performer in that movie i think like like we said earlier just that opening monologue it is just like manic and just like moving at like a hundred miles an hour i think he's really incredible in this movie because he is doing that, right? He's kind of like going insane and kind of, you know, realizes what he's done is so awful and kind of comes to that realization. But like, you know, the the famous baguette scene, of course. What the point I really love in that is when he kind of like turns into a lawyer for a minute. Yes. And he's like, well, actually, Michael, you know, you should have kept me in Wisconsin because this, yep. this, 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 this. <laughs> and it is such a like perfectly dialed kind of thing of like this guy who is kind of going through this crisis, but is still kind of, like, locked into, like, what he does as a career and as a job. He's crazy, but he's also right. <laughs> yeah. You think you got the horses for that? <laughs> Good luck and God bless. <laughs> I just love the fact that with uh, with Wilkinson in this, he has such a diverse range as an actor, and I think this is a great showcase for just all of it, where, like, you see him yep. at such pathetic lows and then at just massive highs in terms of just, like, how much power you can have over a scene where it like, you know, during the baguette scene, like you mentioned, Brian just like kind of takes over. And then like the phone call with Merritt Weaver is like the most sad uh, fucking thing. It's like, Oh my uh, God, you were just like at a low true rock bottom. Yeah. But in a way where you still are just like, you want to see him get out of it. Like get the fuck out of this. What are you talking about? Because he has yeah. that moral core to him of just like realizing that like, I've been doing this awful thing for all this time. Yeah. He's so fucked up, so uh, you have total empathy for him all the way to, like, his his death scene is one of Brutal. the most terrifying 
honestly, in like a non-horror movie context. It just feels like so plausible. It's just, it's so matter of fact and just like, oh, wow, no, he's done. Wow. Okay. I mean, like, because Gilroy has written like many like spy thriller, espionage thriller. And this movie has the kind of energy of that, like of a spy yeah. thriller, even though it's about like lawyers and like corporations and stuff like that. And like, <laughs> yeah. And like, but his death scene is so almost unceremonious in, in, in a good way though. Like I think his, de- it, com- it almost comes out of nowhere and it's, it's so haunting. It, it, yeah. It's not played up with any kind of like over dramatic kind of, you know, whatever it is just like, so yeah, like I said, like matter of fact and just like so blunt. I think what makes his death scene so effective is that his eyes never close. Oh yeah. Yes. His eyes are open the whole time, and you're like, oh, he knows what's happening. Oh, God. It's just, it's so devastating and brutal. He, his performance in this feels so, like, almost vulnerable, mm-hmm. right? Like, not not, be, not just because, like, there's, like, the, the, the kind of footage we see of him, like, getting naked and kind of, yeah. like, you know, having a freak out and everything. But, like, like you said, Thomas, like, how sad he kind of feels and just how, like, almost pathetic he he feels in a lot of ways. And yet, like... I love the way that, like, I think Sidney Pollock is the one who kind of refers to him as, or, or is it Clooney? I think Clooney is like, says, like, you're a killer, right? Yeah, and kind right. of, like, referring to him as he once was and stuff like that. And you you get a sense of that, but I think you really get a sense of just the moral kind of problem he's in and just yeah. him re- the crisis that he's kind of realizing and has come to terms with. And it, it is such a vulnerable performance. And, um, yeah, it, it, it's great. He's such a great fucking actor that he makes one of the most compelling scenes in this movie something where he's just reading off a fucking contract. I know, and it's great. It's so (laughs) great. He's reading the most dry bullshit possible, and he is, like, fucking selling it. Quote, he's reading his overwhelming and immediate. He's like, don't let a scientist put overwhelming and immediate. Immediate in the same same sentence. sentence. Yes. same sentence. (laughs) Oh, my God. Yeah, no, it's good. That's that's a great scene, and he's literally just reading from a, a memorandum. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Oh, and I also love the way that Gilroy shoots that scene, where mm-hmm. it just is like it. You it makes once again this thing that could be just so uninteresting on paper feel incredibly cinematic once again, despite the fact that like what all of this is, is just like a crazy man is like reading, and in, in to no one in his immediate vicinity because he knows no. that he's just being like. <laughs> fucking recorded on the other end uh and it's it's just it, it's so perfectly like done it feels like so operatic despite being that small really when you like, and i love how it. you you hear it from him live you hear it over the phone uh from uh tilda listening to it you hear it through the surveillance equipment the editing of this movie is really good <laughs> it is yeah the, the rhythms of it and like the it keeps especially you the... in yeah, the, in the soundscape, like you mentioned, like the way yeah. it's kind of cutting back and forth, especially like also the the scene you mentioned uh, with Tilda when she's like practicing her speech, the way it's kind of like mm-hmm. cutting back and forth with the audio and, yeah. and just all of that stuff is so great because like it is a lot of it in the editing and kind of the the way he's taking this story, which is not necessarily complex when you really think about it, it, it you know, and kind of yeah. it is about a corporation that has killed people. And there's a there's a document out there, and it exists, and it kind of you know shows all of this in, in black and white, yeah. and they are trying to get rid of it. But and yet the way he kind of moves around this, and the way he he presents it to you, I don't know. It makes it seem like this really like labyrinthian like maze that you're navigating. And yeah, it, yeah. It just it, it's great. You know, I want to shout out just a couple other like supporting people who. Oh, me too. Uh, I, th- I think really w- rule like a uh, Ken Howard, who plays I was John just Jeffries. Say, yes, Ken, who if you don't know out there is like he was a character actor that worked for a while. He was the president of the Screen Actors Guild for okay. several years. Yeah, oh. um, and uh, he I knew him mainly from like Thirty Rock. Yes, uh, yes. My husband and I just finished watching Thirty Rock, so the whole time I'm like, "That's Hank Cooper. That's Cable Town. What is what is, <laughs> what is he doing <laughs> running you North? What is the Cable Town owns the you North? What is happening?" Is this a Shineheart production? What what, right. what is this? <laughs> he looks weird without the mustache now, right? He does. Yes. Yes. But then when you see him with the mustache, you're like, oh, that's that's Hank Cooper. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Especially because like him against Tilda, like he's a warmer presence, but mm-hmm. at the same time, it's like 
he has this definite like CEO quality where he will smile for the cameras and in the moment they're off, just like the bit where he gets interrupted from the interview, which is like, we're having an interview here. We're trying yes. to do something. Like yeah. it, that perfect exasperation. And then that, during the ending when he just goes over like, uh, security, uh, can we get somebody on Michael Clayton over here? That guy, that, yeah, my, my Zoom background for, for the yes. listener at home is one. I when... love that they just walk right past him. <laughs> yes. Right, the tech, and that's when like the detective's like good right up to him. But we, we'll talk about the ending in more detail. We got to, we got like focus on the ending at some point. But, um, I mean, yeah, there's him. There's also Dennis O'Hare, who's oh, great. Yes, like one of the one of the great bad guys. Was just like when Clooney comes and just like I, they told me that you were um really great. This a yes. miracle worker. Oh, so good. Like such a uh, perfect like rich piece of shit who's just like complaining about his ticket out. Part of that scene that really gets me is when the wife just throws her glass. Yes. I was like, yes, you oh, should be yes. exasperated with him. <laughs> yeah, I love Dennis O'Hare. He he's great and he's, you know, he he pops up in um in in duplicity as well. I think he's very good in that. Yeah, he he plays just that like, yeah, just that rich asshole. Oh, just he's a prick. So perfectly. Yes. It's such a great performance and like he Who jogs at night? Yeah. Most a yeah. lot of people do. What the do, fuck was man? he doing? Yeah, just the way do, he's man. the way he's trying to like justify it and and, and just in that way is so, and you see him going through like kind of the process of just like denying it and then justifying it. Great scene. That also is kind of recontextualized because like Mm -hmm. we see it at the beginning and then we come, we we later learn it's like right before the car bombing. Is that true? Yep. Yep. Right. Yeah. And so it is kind of this, you know, at first you're just like, Oh, this guy's an asshole. And then later you're like, that's why this George is... Clinton, that's why Clayton's driving fast. He's like he's pissed at this guy. He's like, yes. who right. fuck are you? Who's this guy? <laughs> but also it, it it almost kind of like feels like this like almost like final nail for Michael yeah. Clayton where he's just like I'm so done with I'm dealing done. with these type of people. Yeah. Like it's just he feels so exasperated in that moment and it's yeah, it's a great kind of recontextualizing of of that scene as well. How do you like a uh, blink and you'll miss her, Catherine Waterston? Right. Oh, I love Catherine Waterston so much. I She's was so great happy when she popped and up. Like, and I had when I revisited this after she, you know, she blew up a little. I was like, oh yeah, that is her. Wow, look at her go in like one scene. I yeah. completely forgot she was in this, and I was just like, yep. I had to like look at it for like, no, no, that isn't. And then she no, pops up, and you're just like, oh yeah. <laughs> And I don't know his name. I'm trying to find him now, but he plays uh, the brother, the brother-in-law, the the cop. Yeah, I apologize. I actually misspoke earlier. Uh, Sean Cullen plays uh, the brother, Gene, uh, who's the police detective. Uh, actually, Austin Williams plays Henry, who's the son, who we were talking about earlier. I liked him in this. He was very good. Yeah, um, especially with just like the um, sort of exasperation he has. Mm-hmm. Like, stay, stay for, stay for an hour. Like, come on. Yeah. Like, I'm going for a shift, but you need to stay like, stay for a bit. Like, they put the girls put so much work into this. Yeah. The delivery on I that love, in particular. <laughs> I love that part, and I love the uh, the line that he gives where he's like, you got all these lawyers thinking you're a cop. You got all these cops thinking you're some <sighs> kind of lawyer. What are you? Yeah. <laughs> Ugh. And and also, just another another one with him is, like, the when they're talking as he's getting, like, ready to go. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, okay. Like, okay. I get it. Yeah. Yeah, it, but just uh, yeah, that that scene's really great. I, I also love. I can't remember his name, but he's like the, he's the the cop that Michael Clayton talks to after they found mustache. Him. Yeah, yeah, he's mustache from, guy. He's from Dexter. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. Mainly what I know him from. But I was just like, oh, it's that guy from Dexter. <laughs> um, yeah, he's really great in like two scenes that he has in the movie. But yeah, what a cast. <laughs> Truly, it's it's so fascinating. Like especially with like what you were talking about earlier Brian kind of like that um Clooney as Cl- Clayton just kind of like realizing like that kind of sense of identity that's another big thing I think throughout Gilroy's works like you even yeah. see like the Bourne movies are literally all about, like who am I um and yeah. then <laughs> and uh, even on Andor like there's so much about like what sort of like your place in a specific a society that's rebelling means like I think yeah. he has like such a great hold on that concept with like Clayton here and you know with uh Wilkinson like the whole movie is Clayton trying to like justify his existence to Wilkins, like no, no c- come on, man, like whatever, like we we let's just go back to where we the way things were, like come on, what are we doing here? And then no Wilkinson, going back. no, and then Wilkinson dies, and we just get like all that spiraling out. It's like such a perfect kind of run, especially when you also have like the thing Brian you referenced this earlier, the book that the kid keeps reading, yeah, 
and how it keeps recurring. Um, it just, I wish it it, it's real. stuff like, right, where it's like, you can tell that, like, that comes from just, like, obviously it's this thing that, like, is connecting him with his son, and it's, like, yeah. just this other background thing of, like, no, wait, yeah, what, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> What's going on here? Yeah, I mean, this is, it's, a, there's a few times in the movie where people go up to Michael Clayton and be like, who are you? What are you? What are you doing yes. anyway? I mean, maybe one of the most, like, cutting lines in the movie is when, like, Clayton says to Arthur, I'm not the enemy, then who are you? Yeah. Which is Oof. such a, it, yeah, it, it, and, like, another thing about, like, a through line of Gilroy's career is just this idea of, like, people in these, you know, corporate positions, espionage positions who are doing, like, awful things, like, just morally reprehensible things, and how they try to get out of it, mm -hmm. and just that idea of, like, can you get out of this world? Can you stop, like, you know, and weirdly enough, like, Born Legacy has, like, a, a that, like, there's this one scene uh, with Norton and, like, a, and Renner that's, like, a flashback where he kind of says, like, we are, like, the the, the sin eaters or whatever. It's a very, mm. it's a really good scene in that movie, but kind of is feels like a lot of what he's interested in, right, is these people who, like, put this burden on themselves to do these horrible things, but... I mean, to what end? And that's kind of what yeah. he's exploring. And, um, I mean, yeah, it just, it, it is such a fascinating kind of idea to explore of just like, what if one of these guys finally kind of discovered like, oh, what I've been doing is like destroying yeah. society. And oh, just this like, is yeah, bad, it, actually. <laughs> yeah. Are we, yeah. Are we the baddies? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But just, like, you you feel, I think, Tom Wilkinson's, like, just emotional and, like, breakdown of just, like, yeah. you know, realizing what he, all of his life has, you know, amounted to doing horrible things to, to innocent people. Yeah, and it, it, it is such a fascinating kind of through line. And, and again, I, I, I cannot overemphasize this. I just love that he brought all of that to a fucking Star Wars show, which is just so cool. <laughs> yeah. For sure. I want to talk about, um, I guess, more of Tony Gilroy's directorial flair, especially considering that this is his first film. Brian, does this feel like a first film to you? Could you even imagine, oh. like, this? Yeah, right? It does not oh. at all. I, and, like, looking through his movie, he's a very good director, I think. One of the things that I think makes him a good director is he's working with Robert Elswit, who is a cinematographer who shot, like, a lot of Paul Thomas Anderson's movies, who this year also shoots There Will Be Blood. Um, yeah, what yes. a year, huh? <laughs> Yeah, and like it, his movies look really great, and they it, this movie kind of like we were talking a lot about like the the cell phones and stuff like that. It feels like a very not digital film, but like kind of two thousand in a way, right? Like yeah. that, that that kind of idea in the two thousands of of digital, right? Not like iPhones and everything, but just like cell phones and computers and just like you know wiretaps and all that stuff. I think it's. And he shows it really well. Like, he's like, I love the way he just shoots all of this stuff. It looks really great. It's a very, like, elegant-looking movie, I think. And I think a lot of that, sort of the digital element of it, is a big shout-out to one of the producers on this movie, Steven Soderbergh. Of course, yeah. yeah. This feels soderbergh -y. Like, if I saw it this does, movie completely yeah. blind, I would have said, like, is that a Steven Soderbergh movie? It's like, no. <laughs> like, you mentioned Out of Sight, uh, which is obviously more film, but even, like, some of his, like, earlier 2000s movies, this has that kind of thing. Like, even Aaron Brockovich, even some of those other ones. A great talky cable movie in that same way. And I think, like, it kind of shares a lot of that, I, that sort of um, exploration of just, like, corporate greed and, you know, capitalism that, like, Soderbergh, like he bakes it really well into his movies and he's like often very subtle, sometimes not so subtle, but like, yeah, he, he loves exploring those ideas as well. It's something like the, the informant for instance, like which did this kind of yes. reminded me of a lot. Um, yeah. Kind of that like late two thousands, early 2010s Soderbergh as well. There's a lot of that in this movie, but it, it doesn't feel, I think like he's ripping off Soderbergh at all. Like I think Soderbergh has a lot of like, idiosyncrasies he loves like those like long zooms and he's got like that that kind of stuff but even i think in the rhythm of it he kind of nails almost the, the spirit of soderbergh in, in a way I, i'm a huge like soderbergh fan but but i loved the way that tony Gilroy directed this movie and i think like i don't know there, there's a lot of weight behind them and in, in the way that they're directed at least um 
I, th- I think a big thing with this one, honestly, and it's particularly his style, is that banality of evil, like underlining banal. Because, yeah. mm-hmm. like, yeah. how many scenes does this movie take place in fucking conference rooms or like the big finales at like a shitty looking hotel? <laughs> Yeah, like that kind of thing. We're just like all this, like these amazing dramatic like scenes are happening. It's just like in like the most shitty rooms. And I think that just like adds this like more character to it in that kind of like Soderbergh way where it is just like, oh, we're shooting in like the locations that we had, which are like very normal buildings. Yeah. But they make it work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and the, like, another kind of like Soderbergh thing I think that that Gilroy also does is like, even though it is obviously about how like corporations are bad. The way that he shoots the offices, like the just office buildings, like they look so like slick, almost just very uh-huh. like, yeah, you know, fancy corporate offices that are very nice and very, you know, just the idea. And I mean, we talked about like Tom Wilkinson's death, which is so just like blunt and has no like frills. He's not shooting it like a set piece or anything like that. And especially also, the, you have the set dressing on Wilkinson's apartment is perfect for like a guy who's going through it. <laughs> Yeah. Like, it's perfect. It's like all the right amount of, oh, bud, you should pick up. This yeah. Is, this will look great. <laughs> and I mean, like, also just, I love how much of this movie hinges on, like, a document. Like, how yeah, much yes. of it is just about, I love a movie about documents. It's just my favorite thing. Like, when it's they cut neat. to, like, Memorandum 229, and I'm just like, oh, my Ooh. God. And it's like, it's a piece of paper, but it's just so... Like, you know, you feel kind of the weight that he, he gives it because of, This is you know. the puzzle piece. Right, right, yeah. exactly. Uh, how do you feel about uh, Gilroy's direction in this match? Like you guys said, it does not feel like a debut feature at all. This looks like and feels like the work of a seasoned veteran who has been making movies for at least 15, 20 years. And I don't know how he pulled it off, but bless him for doing it because <laughs> this movie is, like I keep saying, hard to sell people on. But once you get into it, you're hooked. You are hooked five minutes in. And this movie does not let go until Clooney's in that taxi cab for $50 worth. I mean, it just, you're along for the ride, and you don't want to get off. No, yeah, it's a bummer that Gearroy's only made three movies, really. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah, not since, like, Legacy, which is, like, 2012. So it's been a very long yeah. time. But, I mean, he's directed, what, like, a couple episodes of Andor. Right, hasn't he? Or is he not? Just he's only written. I think he only is a writer on that show. Oh. Which I, I, I'm not complaining because I think he's a, a, a really great writer. Like, I think he, you know, we're, we're talking about him as like a director, but I think like all the themes he's interested in and, and the way he sh- like chooses to present those themes is, is so fascinating and is so interesting. And like, you know, is, is like you mentioned earlier, Thomas, this movie could feel like it was like, a forgettable legal thriller that like is is oscar bait or whatever but it's so not that it is so compelling because of gilroy's writing like he's a really 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 good writer which makes sense because he's been like you know writing since like the 90s and everything but yeah i think that just really kind of is a great showcase for him it definitely feels like he was kind of like waiting in the wings to direct something yeah like right. because of just like how long he'd been in the industry and then finally just like let it all out wonderfully here and while i do like duplicity and born legacy they aren't quite as up obviously like it's hard to follow up something like this perfect yeah, quite frankly really, yeah, yeah. as a movie you really can't <laughs> no no but at the same time i would love to see him be able to direct something else but sadly i think a big thing with like you know the three movies he's directed two of them are movies that would probably not get made and released in theaters anymore and if they were made, they would be, like, six-episode seasons of a Netflix show or something. Ugh. And not yeah. nearly as good. <laughs> I mean, that is a big thing with, with like, the you know, Born Legacy notwithstanding, because, of course, it's part of a bigger franchise and everything. But, like, you know, we talk a lot about, like, you know, like, Matt, you kind of joked earlier, like they, they don't make them like this anymore. But, like, they don't, they don't. Really <laughs> make movies they like don't. this. Like, and, it what you know, when they do, it's just, like garbage filler for netflix yeah and it's, it's you just know, some streaming bullshit and and mm-hmm. they don't star like huge a-list actors no, like don't. this no. you know it, you know and obviously part of it is just like you know the death of the movie star all this stuff but like yeah they don't make these kinds of movies anymore these kind of no. tight corporate legal thriller like the, you know it's not really a genre that exists anymore uh, i think ebert used to call them movies for grown-ups I mean, yes. yeah. Yes. I mean, they like, don't really make movies for grown-ups anymore with big stars. 
when I watched this for the first time, all I could think of like was like, oh, this is like a proper movie for grown-ups. Yes. And not in the <laughs> sense of like, you know, not because like I not because it doesn't have like comic book heroes or anything like that, but just yeah. because like it feels like a movie that like obviously requires all of your attention and just is about these dense like moral issues and like societal issues in a way that just feels like made for adults like it, it is it's yeah. really great to watch a movie like this even though it is a bit sad that you know we don't get them as much anymore but no that's a shame no though it is very it, funny to kind of realize this is a decade after batman and robin and just <laughs> that decade that that transitional decade for Clooney leading up to this it's just like it's it's remarkable and it feels really like he just earns his place as one of the great movie stars like obviously like earlier than this but particularly w- when i think of george clooney as a movie star it's the ending of this fucking movie yeah the yeah. We, we might as well talk about just in a bit more detail the this interaction with uh tilda swinton and george clooney that puts you on such a fucking emotional roller coaster where you're just like, is he going to do it? Is he going to... Oh, no, is he going to take the money? Oh, no, he's not taking the money! Of course he isn't! Yeah, yeah. Fuck yes! <laughs> like, oh, shit! <laughs> he got her now! <laughs> it's so good. It's just so, so good. good. I mean, yeah. does he look like he's negotiating? Oh. Tilda? Does he look like he's negotiating? No, he does not. <laughs> the, the amount of weight that Clooney delivers that line with is, it could, like, oh, it can move mountains. Like, it's just so powerful. And the fact that he starts it off fucking around with her, saying, yes. yeah, oh, right. <laughs> freaky, right? I think Arthur's walking yes. around here somewhere. <laughs> yes. It's like, wow, <laughs> you're going for the jugular right off the bat. Good for you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and again, part of, like, what we were talking about earlier of, like, this feeling like an adult movie, all this stuff, like, the fact that this entire movie, the the crux of it, this kind of, like, final moment is just this conversation, Mm -hmm. and it's incredibly well written, like, it's just so, like, such good writing, and it works so, so well. It's, it's like, it's like a prize fight. Yeah. Yes, it's it really is a prize fight between uh, Tilda and George, and it's it, they're just knocking each other down left and right, and then he kind of you know keeps punching down. <laughs> and I had forgotten kind of how quickly we get to this ending. Really, like I I don't know I I, I think the last like hour or so of this movie really flies by. It's brisk and like yes. it, yeah I, I I you know I was kind of. Because as it's kind of teeing up with like her in the her in the bathroom and getting ready and everything, I was like, "Oh, fucking here we go, <laughs> baby! We're fun. This is the scene." Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and especially just to shout also like what we're talking about Clooney so much, but like Tilda's delivery, particularly on the bit where she says like, "Where do you think I'm gonna get ten million dollars?" Oh, so good. <laughs> what do you mean ten million? What? Where am I gonna get ten million dollars? <laughs> I, I really think that Tilda Swinton in the scene is doing some of the best, like, eye acting I've mm-hmm. ever seen. Like, I, just watching her eyes, like, dart around, just the way, like, you, you can tell so much of what she's, like, thinking. And just see yeah. her processing all of it, like, all in her eyes. It, it's just phenomenal. <laughs> and shadow to contrast that Clooney is doing a lot of great control of his head bobbing. Yes. Like, whenever yes. they would joke about Clooney in the 90s, it tended to be about his head bobbling. Yeah, and I think sure. what's, yeah. what works so geniusly is, like, in his, like, movie star run, he utilizes it perfectly. Like, the way he is, like, specifically moving his head and tilting yes. it during this whole scene <laughs> is so perfect. So well done. God, I love him in this fucking movie. <laughs> it's it's, it, it, it's I, truly uh... just one of the great endings of, like, the, the 21st century. And, and the it's... fact that this whole thing he's doing with Tilda here is just basically admitting that he's a piece of shit. Yes. He's yeah. like he's like, yeah, I get it now. I'm I'm garbage. That's great. And when he goes up to uh to his brother in law and he's like, Yeah, did you get all that? All right, great. Great. Like it feels a bit ceremonious because you're just like, Oh my fucking god, this is so well directed and so well acted and every you know, everything about like the scene you you're kind of pumping your fist because it's great, but it it doesn't feel like a victory in any way, no. right? It doesn't no. feel like a celebration or anything. Like, yeah, they got caught. They got theirs, but Michael got nothing, basically. Right. He and got just... five grand out of the deal at the end of the day. And 
that's what he's going to be living on for a bit. Like, ugh. Yeah, and just, I mean, like, you know, just kind of inferring, like, just, like, the, they this, this corporation will be fine. And they will oh, yeah. still, like, be doing evil shit. Yep. Even though, like, you know, Tilda's fucked and is, like, going to prison, maybe. <laughs> but, yeah. like, you know, it, yeah, it, it has this very, like just solemn ending finding out what's happening of just like seeing the the all the the detectives walk up and like my favorite moment i think is when you it's kind of out of focus but you see tilda like on her knees like on her hands and knees just like collapsing yeah Yeah. beautiful it's it's not overly dramatic or anything and and this kind of movie could feel that way like gilroy really manages to not have it feel like overwrought or anything or melodramatic or whatever, which I love. Like, especially the fact that like after like this amazing, like you mentioned, like moment that does kind of feel triumphant to some degree happens. You see him like, as he's walking all the way to that cab, like going down the escalator, going through the front door, you just see him the entire time thinking like, yeah, I did it. Yeah. 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 (laughs) And then by the time he gets into that cab and his delivery on, just like, give me $50 worth. Just it's just like just, just keep drive. drive. Like it reminds me of the great seventies like yeah. movies made for yeah. grown ups endings. Like I could see this you know happening in like seventy six and being shot on film, and it, but it still has that same weight with just Clooney in two thousand seven. Yeah, just like a seventies Michael Clayton with like Walter Matthau just saying oh, oh. just drive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that one shot that's over just that first half of the end credits, like you're you're mentioning Matt, like it just it is such a perfect way to leave you out on for this movie. Like, I imagine, obviously, that's, like, the moment the the house lights went up, and he's still just sitting there when you saw it originally. No, actually, the house lights actually came on when the credits proper started. Like, okay. the black screen. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Gotcha. They let it. They let it stay dark while, you know, Clooney was going through it. Fuck yeah. I think Thankfully. I, what, I, what I love about this ending as well is just, like, it's my favorite type of ending of just, like, it's a guy just contemplating, like, well, what now? Like, yeah. or like, yes. or, or just like, kind of like, I wa- he won technically, you know, but like, <laughs> but like to what end and like, what, what was yeah. this all worth? To and go like, back to what's... work on Monday to the office where everyone thinks he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's just, yeah, I love just that type of ending and just, yeah, it ending on just the character just thinking like, what's the point of all this though? Like, what, what are we doing here? What is this? Yeah. And he still has to live with just like my, my mentor's dead. And yeah. um, i still am like, you know, broke. And I still have like this kind of relationship with my son. That's kind of there, but I don't know how that's going to work out now. That's <laughs> like the one lingering thread I have. You, you see all of that way on his face. Wonderfully in that final shot. Yeah. Um, and also probably my favorite bit of the score from James Newton Howard. It's oh great. yes. It's a perfect final track for the score as well. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, do some final thoughts, mention anything we haven't mentioned or anything like that. Matt, final thoughts on Michael Clayton. It's one of the greatest films I've ever seen. I adore this from start to finish. It's my favorite movie from 2007. I still think that George Clooney should have won that year. Um, sorry, uh, Daniel Plainview, but <laughs> I don't know. You, The Academy went with most acting instead of best acting, which they are <laughs> tending to do. And then, you know, hey, he would lose to Dan Lady Lewis a couple years later. So that's wonderful. So they're arch enemies, and that's great. Uh, no, Michael Clayton's fantastic. Uh, if you haven't seen it, please do. Uh, it's hard not to love. Like, you're gonna love it. You're gonna have a good time. You might not have a good time, but you'll <laughs> you'll be into the movie, you know? It's a real romp, though. That's what you said. Yeah. Like, a real romp of yeah. the time. <laughs> Yeah, it's all about pesticides and lawyers and <laughs> lofts and bread. It's, it's Sounds like a romp to me, Matt. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> good time in the city. <laughs> oh, Brian, final thoughts on Michael Clayton. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I, I love this movie. I think it, it gets better, you know, as I rewatch it. Like, I... Just us talking about it, I want to rewatch it again, like already. <laughs> Me too. Like, yeah, and I just it's... watched it twice. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but it, like, it is such a compelling movie in yeah. every way. Like, yeah, it, it is like not a very easy movie to describe. Even like the <laughs> plot of it is, it, it's not easy to describe at all. And, and just, I think a lot of the themes and the ideas here, like, really speak to me personally. Movie, like I said, I love movies about like documents and offices and like 
corporate motherfuckers and like all that stuff I, I love it i think it's so great and i think like it's such a prime example of like not just like the kinds of movies that we want more of but just like feel like real like adult movies i don't know like i, I i'm trying to like i can't really think of the last movie that really kind of hit the same like itch for me like maybe like a movie i thought of while i was watching this was um uh deep water the the, the todd haynes movie the, the with mark mark, mark ruffalo i want to see that I it's got see that one kind of similar vibes i think to this of just like it's, nice. got, it's about pesticides it's about oh, like pfft. corporations yeah. and like paperwork so much paperwork in that movie that pesticide cinematic universe yeah. i mean <laughs> Does Michael Clayton come in at the very end? Just like, I'm here to talk to you about the pesticide oh initiative. Yes. I'm putting together a team. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, but I, I, I love this movie. It, it, it really is kind of one of these movies that really, I think, will stand the test of time, especially when we talk about like the 21st century oh, like, yeah. American cinema, especially. And I think it's one of the best showcases for Clooney. Like, I think you could show this to someone who maybe is unfamiliar with Clooney or doesn't really even doesn't like Clooney. And I think you'd still be so compelled by yeah. what he's doing here. Obviously tilt is great. And like, I think really deserve that Oscar, even though I think Kate Blanchett as a, in I'm not there is a, is a really great performance. And I think is just, I, I, Oh, that's what she was up against, huh? Yeah. Okay. I, so, wow. I mean, it, it, it would be close for me, but um, yeah, I, lo- I, I think she's really incredible in this movie and um, rest in peace, Tom Wilkinson. And he's just, this is another great showcase for Tom Wilkinson. I just think one of his best performances and uh, yeah, just a great showcase for what he brought to the screen. Yeah. I, I love this movie. I think it's great. And I'm so happy we got to talk about it. God, it's, I want to fucking watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to mention what well, you mentioned. Kate Blanchett was nominated against Tilda, but also it was a Ruby D for American gangster. Saoirse oh, Ronan okay. at a young age for atonement. And then yeah. uh, Amy Ryan for Gone Baby Gone. There's some really good performances in that. Run. Those are some good ones, yeah. And then Tom Wilkinson, was, like, he lost to Bardem, but, you know. Yeah. Bardem's pretty good in No Country. Hard to argue that. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's pretty good. He's pretty good <laughs> in that movie. <laughs> well, that's the thing, yeah. This is definitely, like, this is part of, like, 2007 is a really good year for movies. Yeah. yeah. A lot, lot of great movies. And that's one of those great Oscar, like, Runs in particular, like I said, I, this was around the time I was really getting into the Oscars, and it was just like, yeah, not a lot of bad movies in that bunch. No, no. When you look at like all the best pictures, like this was nominated, obviously, No Country Wins, and There Will Be Blood was nominated, but also Juno and Atonement, like, and especially some of those are ones that like I'm so shocked would like be as big as they are. Like, you would never have a Juno type success today. <laughs> No. Really, that's such a, a a particular product of its time, and so is Clayton. Like we kind of mentioned, it's definitely a movie that we wouldn't really get made in the same way today. But it's it's such a shame, and especially such a shame that a Tony Gilroy, who I, I want to mention that, like after you know, like he kind of does his last thing with Born Legacy, it's not like a great career, sadly for him either, because he like his only other credits are Rogue One, where he's like ghost directing, like we kind of mentioned, yeah, the, and then that Matt Damon movie, The Great Wall. That was him. Oh yeah, yeah. He he had like I'm sure he was one of ten thousand writers on that movie. Probably. Um, and also yeah. the the John Hamm movie Beirut, and that's 2018. He hasn't been credited with a movie since then. I remember that movie. I remember seeing things for that movie. Wow. I, I kind of want to watch it just because he wrote it. Like I I don't know. Maybe he's True. maybe he's bringing some juice to that movie. And I love John Hamm. But, yeah, um, I'm a sucker for some ham. Right, yeah. but. But at the same time, yeah, Andor really felt like him finally being able to, like, actually do something again. Yeah. And that's what I would want way more of that. Like, I want, like, give Tony Gilroy all of his flowers way more than he's gotten, quite frankly. Feel, and Andor feels like he really has, like, control over it. You know what yes. I mean? Like, it, or not, con- you know, but it feels like it's his vision, really. Yeah. Like, it really doesn't feel like, you know, unlike the other Star Wars shows. Like it, you, you really get a sense of like, okay, no, there, this has like something to say. It feels like a TV show as opposed to just a six toy hour commercial long movie and a, and a toy commercial. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. And it, it, it just, yeah. I, I also just want him to just be able to make whatever you want, but also give me Andor season two, please. <laughs> and also give me a casting in Andor doll, but I will say Tony Gilroy lines. <laughs> yes. I want that. I want that. You can like pull the string on it. <laughs> I'm Shiva, the god of death. (laughs) (laughs) 
Look, if you give me a toy of Stellan Skarsgård, that'll do his monologues. I'm so down. Yes, please. Oh, 100%. Uninterrupted, like, five-minute <laughs> talk <laughs> from this story. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yes. Uh, but overall, yeah, Michael Clayton, great movie. You guys said it so well, but, like, great cast, so well-written. Such a great uh, movie. And a true great example of, like, a movie that, like, win has at least, like, its Oscar win is, like, so well-deserved. Uh, oh, yeah. For especially yeah. such an odd... Like, if you told me, like, this movie's going to win one award of those, I wouldn't expect Tilda. No. But it's yeah. amazing if that happens. <laughs> it's so great. It's such a great showcase for her and all these other people. And this watch jumped it up to, like, just five out of five, like, one of my favorite movies at this point. Hey. That's what I like yeah. to hear. <laughs> I, I've done good work here. My work uh, is done. My work here is done. <laughs> Matt's flying away, guys. He's I will like, say... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I will say, Matt, I think you kind of hearing, like, your praise for it kind of, like, a few years ago, like, I, I think I'm a Michael you, Clayton uh, street preacher. <laughs> yeah, right. but I think I think you were kind of one of the big, like, points where I saw you tweeting about it, and I was like, oh, fuck, I gotta watch Michael Clayton then, because, like, Matt really loves this movie. I like, <laughs> But, yeah, I'm, but thank you for kind of for, Glad like, to be a, making uh, me watch this finally. Clayton influencer. <laughs> yes, though I would recommend probably stop doing that in parking lots. I can't help it. <laughs> Have you seen Michael Clayton? <laughs> Who? It's a movie, damn it. <laughs> oh, we gotta feel mad at a GL after this, but... <laughs> you just uh. kept yelling at me about George Clooney and baguettes. I didn't understand. Like, what? <laughs> he had an arm full of baguettes and a great winter coat. Why? <laughs> He gave me one of the pieces of bread. It was really good, but, like, I don't know what he was talking good, about. I, I had to call the police on him. He was freaking me out. Well, on that note, uh, I, I can't think of another great way to end the Clayton discussions. So let's get to our regular segment, Between the Lines. So on every episode, uh, Brian, myself, and a guest uh, usually like to recommend another movie that either fits, you know, what would be the topic of this episode, like an alternate M for Masterpiece pick for the 1-1 Oscar thing, or it could be, you know, related to the movie we're talking about in some way. And Brian, you're going first. What's your recommendation? Yeah, um, this is kind of a, a bit of a coincidence, considering it's the same Oscar year. We've, we've mentioned this movie uh, throughout this episode, but I'm I'm recommending No Country for Old Men. I'm in the midst of a uh a cohen's like retrospective i'm watching all of their movies again uh you know just kind of going through and watching a bunch of them and i had not seen no country for old men in maybe a a decade or so like i watched it when i was like early in high school kind of like really getting into like oscars and kind of you know the cohen brothers especially but um i hadn't seen it since and i was really curious to rewatch it and a bit nervous as well because i think it has kind of a it has a reputation and it you know is lauded as this like masterpiece and and whatever and so I, I rewatched it and I I do agree it is a an absolute masterpiece. Um, I I really just forgot how much of the movie is is very tight and is about kind of like just weird just details and just so like specific and how much of it is like Josh Brolin like picking like shells uh like bullet shells out of his like shoulder and just like healing himself it's i i forgot how slow and like tightly paced it was you know because i think like yes javier bardem is very good in the movie i think he's you know probably deserved that oscar but i also just forgot how great uh, tommy lee jones is in this movie i think it really he is just absolutely phenomenal in it it, it is a very bleak movie like about as bleak as I remember it being, it feels bleak, but it doesn't feel like I don't know, like a Lars von Trier movie. He's always my go-to for just like bleak, pessimistic shit. But um, it, it doesn't feel that way necessarily. And it, it, I don't know, they really tap into this story in a really interesting way. And it's, I mean, there's a case to be made that Roger Deakins should have won his Oscar for this movie. 
I feel like you can say that for a lot of movies that Roger Deakins shot. <laughs> um, and also, I think Kelly McDonald, I had forgotten how unbelievably good she is. Mm-hmm. I, I, She's fantastic in that movie. Yeah, like, I think not just, like, just her interactions with, like, Llewellyn, but, like, the ending scene with her and, 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 and Anton Chigurh, like, is such a great showcase for her. I think she should have been nominated. Yeah, I don't know. It, it, it's weird because it's a movie that I think, like, is very beloved, of course, and has a reputation, but I think almost is that good for me. Like, I, I just was really transfixed by it and it i don't know it, there's something about it that i find so mesmerizing i don't think it's their best movie necessarily i, I still think inside lewin davis is is their best movie in my opinion but um yeah i i love it and i think you know it's one of the ones i haven't revisited in a long time and i was worried you know because that can always go a bit a bit sideways but um it holds up <laughs> it, it really really more holds than holds up, up. Yeah. yeah yeah but um yeah, I don't know. You, you you guys like this movie, I'm, I, I'm sure. I don't know. Uh, how do you guys oh, it's great. Country for Old Men? Adore it. Terrible film. Awful. What do you think? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, I remember, though, I, 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 was, I kind of mentioned this earlier. I did the whole like double feature with this, and there, um, there will be blood. And I still remember at the same time, though, a lot of like normies around that time, like people I interacted with, when they saw it, they were very disappointed, particularly by its ending. Sure heard a lot of that but i think what's so interesting about it is just the, despite how like it looks gorgeous and it's wonderfully shot by deacons like you mentioned but also it has doesn't have like a lot of thrills to it like on paper this should be no. like the most propulsive thing consistently but like it's a very casual version of like a guy finds a bag of money yeah. and then goes on the run movie <laughs> and that's, that, that's what makes it like so haunting that shootout is thrilling though in the mm-hmm. streets oh my gosh, oh my yes. god but it is such a quiet movie. Like I, had for, it has no score, obviously, which is like you it has know, very big, little like, score, very little score. Yeah, it, yeah. it, it, it just, has that awesome like four notes from Carter Burwell. Yes, yeah. Carter yeah. Burwell toyed around on a piano for thirty minutes. And then oh, it's so good. <laughs> it was it, so good. I think a lot. There's like music over the credits that m- might have been like more of his score, and it yeah. sounds yeah, really yeah. great. But yeah. I think like the movie works so well, and it's such mm-hmm. a yeah. It is so quiet for so much of it, and like yeah, when you get those like big shootouts and like. It, yeah, they are incredibly like thrilling, but a lot of the movie is just like these 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 men just like healing themselves yes. and like just like doing like yeah, just the him like sawing the 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 shotgun or whatever. A lot of like those things that I really like forgot how much of that is in the movie when people think like you know what's the most you ever lost on a coin toss and all you know all that stuff like with with sugar which is like very showy and whatever. But I love just all of the quiet like moments um sorry thomas I, I i interrupted you a bit no no it's fine i mean i just I, the only other thing i really want to shout out is um underrated woody harrelson turn oh, woody yes. is so fucking good and he shows up for like two scenes of this movie <laughs> yeah <Yes. laughs> it's, it's just like the guy's like oh i'll take care of this and then he doesn't take sure care you of will <laughs> sure you will buddy <laughs> so good at that um but yeah so i'll go ahead then with uh my pick uh, which was one that actually, uh, this was a, an episode we should mention was voted on by our patrons, uh, patreon.com slash cinema number two letter. Uh, they voted between this and my recommendation choice, which is Goodwill Hunting, uh, which is another film that won Oscars, you know, about a decade prior to Michael Clayton, uh, directed by Gus Van Sant, written by Ben Affleck and Matt Damon, um, who won an Oscar for this movie, which is still fascinating. Baffling that I've never seen this movie. Oh, oh really? Wow. Never, I've never seen Goodwill Hunting. Yeah. Huh. Well, um, well, uh, I'll tell Crazy, you. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to recommend it to you. Maybe here on the show. I've seen uh, Goodwill Hunting too. Oh, yeah, it's hunting season. Yes. Uh, this is a joke in Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, Brian. Apple this, sauce, a bit bitch. Of okay. <laughs> For a minute, I was like, is that like a straight to DVD sequel? Or something? I didn't know. <laughs> like <laughs> the best part of that movie. But anyway, um, agreed. But. Uh, <laughs> Goodwill Hunting um, is, I think, like this is one that definitely got a lot more sort of like that kind of um, overrated Oscar kind of negative feedback. I think after it came mm-hmm. out, mm-hmm. especially in the wake of like Affleck's kind of rise to stardom at that point, one of his many weird <laughs> twists and turns of his career. <laughs> because it was the first time I'd rewatched it for in about like a decade or so, so I was kind of worried like, is this going to hold up as well? And I think it's just like such a well put together little character drama that has, like, so much weight put into, like, all the performances. Even, like, as, you know, much as we 
we have varying opinions on like Matt and Damon and Ben Affleck, like depending on, you know, I think they can be hit or miss, but I think this is a phenomenal initial performance for that initial, but like an early performance from them. And even their script, I think just works wonderfully, especially when you consider how weird it could have gone. Cause there was a whole thing where they originally wrote it as like a thriller where it becomes like, oh, they're after Matt Damon, the CIA, because of, like, how smart he is with math problems. And then everyone was like, cut that shit out. Just stick with the, the fucking psychologist. And that, it's, obviously, Robin Williams won his Oscar for this movie. Um, I think another great, like, a great supporting actor win, I would say. It's like, it's not just the fact that, like, he'd shown he could be dramatic before this. But it's, like, such a great showcase for how he can be like such a commanding presence when you actually allow him to like really live in a character like this and have some of that Robin sweetness, but then have like the intensity that you would get out of even like some of his more like over the top comedic performances. He like hones it into this great back and forth with Damon. I mean, I mentioned Stellan Skarsgård earlier. He's great in this mini driver is also phenomenal. Um, I think a a great uh, Oscar nom for her as well for sporting actress and Van Sant, I haven't seen a lot of Van Sant, but it's so interesting that he can make a movie this commercial, and like that would I could see why in '97 it was like such a massive hit that everyone really glommed onto it and won all these awards, and then just follow it up with like the fucking Psycho remake, just like you do, you man. Well, he did that, <laughs> didn't he? Right he did after this, that. that was oh, his cachet. <laughs> that movie is interesting. It's bad, but it's fascinating. It's just like a thing that somehow exists. It's an but, interesting experiment. Uh, yes, at least I think. At the least, yes, I, I'll give it that. But um, I think, yeah, uh, Good Will Hunting rules. Um, so, Brian, I believe you have seen this movie, right? I have, yeah. Um, I, I have seen almost all of Gus Van Sant's movies. Uh, I think the only one I haven't seen is, like, Psycho. Jerry. Oh. No, I have I have seen Psycho. I d- weirdly enough, I don't hate that movie necessarily. I, I don't I, hate it either. I think it's an interesting yeah. experiment. Like, literally, that's just that's my thoughts on that movie. It, it's, it's interesting that he made that. But yeah, I haven't visited Goodwill Hunting in like you like over a, over a decade. It's kind of one of those like I feel like it is one of those like 90s Oscar win- Oscar kind of movies that you watch and then you kind of forget about them after a while, but I I would be curious to watch it as well because I I I I I'm really fascinated by the kind of late career moves of Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. Like I think they both have such great and fascinating like recent career moves. For, for different reasons, of course, but like, yeah, I, I would be curious to rewatch this, um, especially because I, I have a very love-hate relationship with Gus Van Sant, like, I, I love, like, for example, one of my favorite movies of his is um, Last Days, the kind of, the, the not Kurt Cobain. Oh, the Cobain movie, yeah. Right. Yeah. I've always wanted to see that. It's fantastic. It is very good. Um, but then, of course, like, his last, not his last movie, but one of the last movies he made was, like, The Sea of Trees Remember that movie? Oh, the McConaughey uh, Suicide Forest, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And God, that movie I remember being like, it premiered at like Cannes and everyone hated it. And then A24 <laughs> picked it up as like a, fine, we'll put it out, whatever. And then everyone yeah. also hated it here. But anyways, I, I, I would like to revisit Goodwill Hunting, especially because I, I quite like Van Sant in that kind of field like i love i I don't love but i I like finding forrester quite a bit i think it's it's a pretty good movie great internet meme yeah you're you're the man now dog um (laughs) dog now man (laughs) (laughs) well and matt you have a recommendation right i'm gonna go with uh, a little film from 1996 that i just saw from the first time called jerry Maguire. yeah this movie uh i had never seen before i saw it uh about a week and a half ago and was absolutely blown away. I knew basically nothing going in. I just knew that he was a sports agent, and his life went bad, and that's all I knew. (laughs) And of course I knew, you know, the whole, you had me at hello. It's actually really good. It's actually, like, a great movie. Uh, Everyone in it just gives fantastic performances. Uh, Cameron Crowe's script is tight as hell. Uh, His direction is great. Uh, It's gorgeous, thanks to, you know, Janusz Kaminski shooting the whole darn oh, thing. Shit. Uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. won for this, and that was his big, you know, boisterous Oscar speech, which, uh, that that could have gone better. But this movie's great. I, I love it. It's It's got that, I guess it's connected to Michael Clayton because it has that corporate feel, but still not really. 
But it's just, it's one of those, like, classic romantic comedies that, I mean, I just saw it a week and a half ago, but I'm already, like, planning it. Like, oh, maybe I'll watch it again this summer. Like, that's that's a pretty good movie. Uh, side note, my husband and I are doing a full career Tom Cruise retrospective right now. Mm. So that's how Hell we did yes. that. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, guys. Uh, tonight we watched Tropic Thunder, and still great. Uh, still freaking great. Uh, but no, he's fantastic in this one too, and it's kind of baffling he didn't win the Oscar for this one. It's uh, weird, actually, because he goes through every emotion you could imagine in Jerry Maguire, and they still gave it to some guy playing the piano. So, okay, cool. That's nice. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> Thanks, Weinstein. Thanks. <laughs> You know, I really I haven't seen Jerry Maguire either. Um, oh, it's phenomenal! I, it's, you'll you'll love it. It's it's great. Yeah, the only the only Cameron Crowe movie I've seen is Almost Famous, and that was like I saw it's it. Like, pretty, I saw that like in high school, so it's been it's a, a pretty very good long movie. Time. It's pretty um, good. Yeah, I, that and Vanilla Sky are two of my big cruise blind spots. I don't have weird movie, those, but um, very weird. Van- Vanilla Sky, weird movie. <laughs> the only thing I know about Vanilla Sky is that they they play Radiohead at some point. Which... Along with a lot of other needle drops. <laughs> yeah, okay. there's a ton of needle drops in that movie. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I I need to watch those, especially because I I I also it's pretty have good. kind of been on a cruise kick like on, last year. I did been on I did a bunch control. of them. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I didn't see Jerry Maguire until um, like a couple years ago. But what what's interesting about Jerry Maguire really is like when I was younger, that was sort of like my perception of what this is like a movie adults like. Like yeah. I was a very little kid. <laughs> Yeah. Roughly is what it was, and I think I kind of put a stigma on it, and I think that's I think that's another one that kind of suffers from like the post Oscar it kind of like got that oh it's overrated people loved it too much yeah. it got that kind of thing and I, that seared me away from it for a while but then I watched it and I completely agree with you Matt it's a great movie it's, it's so a phenomenal good. movie that it's, it's just so such good. a great like genuine feel good movie and I, I agree with you like everyone is so great in Zellweger and I, Cruise, yeah, I didn't Cruise. even mention her she's great right. Right, phenomenal. And even, like, Cruz, I agree with you, it has so much of, like, his different flavors, particularly that one bit when he quits, and yes. he's just, like, he goes, like, almost like Woody from Toy Story, which is, like, his arm movement. just like, don't worry about me! <laughs> I'm great! I got, uh, it's... I got my fish. We're good. <laughs> yes. Uh, and that fucking uh, Lip Nicky, right? That's Jonathan Lip Nicky as a kid? Yeah, a little kid, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Cute uh, as hell. Like, cute kid. One of the great, like, cute kid performances, yes. Yeah. You know the human head weighs eight pounds? Yes. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> and so it's also been, like, it, I think particularly when you look at it from the perspective of, like, Kuba, who was, like, obviously, like, that, he said, like, he was on top of the world in his, like, big, boisterous Oscar speech. And uh, what a fall. Yeah. Truly. Like, what a massive fall from, like, immediately almost. Like, I that dude was in Snow Dogs and Boat Trip within a couple years. Of that Oscar win. <laughs> I remember reading about how he uh, wanted to audition, or he did audition for Collateral. <laughs> and Man was like, no, you work with Cruz already. It won't work. No, I need someone new. Sorry. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> we have chemistry. We're good. Yeah, I don't care. Get out. Get out of my office. <laughs> oh, well... On that note, let's uh, just repeat our tiles for everybody out there in case you want to add them to your watch list, and we'll go in the uh, order we were... Uh, introducing them in Brian. Uh, yes, I had the Cohen Brothers 2007 Best Picture winner, uh, No Country for Old Men. And uh, I had the 1997 Gus Van Sant film, which won uh, Best Supporting Actor and Best Original Screenplay, Good Will Hunting. And as for me, I had, we just talked about it, uh, the 1996 film Jerry Maguire, which won Best Supporting Actor. I'm, I'm glad that we all committed to that bit of like remembering what it won. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is an informative <laughs> show, kids. <laughs> Um, stuff that you can look up on Wikipedia. Um, but, well, I'll wrap things up here. We want to thank some people like Burial Grid for our intro uh, and all the music on the show. Uh, thank you. Uh, you can find him on uh, BurialGrid.com. Produces music there. We want to thank uh, Michelle Kyle for our, our artwork. Find her at MishKyle96 on Twitter. And thanks to our supporters on Patreon, our sinniest Patreon supporters at Patreon.com slash Cinema number two letter, where for just $1 a month, you can do stuff like vote for episodes that we do on the show like this one thank you so much and uh also you get bonus stuff like we'll have our los awards coming up our own version of the oscars for the patrons 
grind where I'm whittling those down. It's an intense process, and I can't wait to uh, put that out there for the people. Yeah, I totally haven't abandoned my shortlist for about a week and not looked at it. Right, no, anything. you treat this seriously. <laughs> this is an award-voting body of two dudes who are just making lists. Yep. <laughs> it's real crucial. <laughs> lists are fun, though. They're oh, very So fun. much fun. And, you know, speaking of the Patreon, uh, next month we're going to be doing our March Madness, uh, which we did back in the Double Edge Double Bill days, uh, where we would, you know, have... 32 different options that would face off against each other in a bracket format. We're doing that again now for Cinema to the Letter. Uh, and uh, this year it's going to be all movie monster themed. And uh, usually with the March Madness Patreon, we take uh, six different choices from um, the two hosts, myself and Brian. And then also we'll have three other people who will be on that particular podcast where we'll have the, you know, various different monsters face off against each other in the bracket format. Um, But that only comes up to 30 choices. So for the remaining two, we are going to ask our patrons, our Sinius patrons, to um, help us out. Uh, Later this week, there will be a big call to action post that will have the list of all the different ones we currently have uh, for the March Madness bracket. And then we're going to take two suggestions from two different patrons that comment in uh, that particular post uh, for movie monsters that aren't currently on the list. Um, so we can put them in little places and we'll make sure to shout you out on the podcast episode and everything like that. So uh, just make sure to uh, please uh, help us out with that. Um, it'll be near the end of the week, you know, either Thursday or Friday. And we'll have that up for, you know, the weekend or so for you all to submit different options. And then, uh, yeah, we'll include two of them as part of the big 32 for the big podcast, which will come out by the end of March on the Patreon, patreon.com slash cinema number two letter. And we also want to thank Matt, our guest. Matt, thank you That's so me. much for coming on. <laughs> yes, the, thank the you perfect so person for the Michael Clayton episode. So much fun tonight. This was a blast. <laughs> oh. We had a lot of fun for sure. But plug yourself. Where can people find you on the internet? Sure. Uh, you can find me literally everywhere at the real Matt C. Uh, stay tuned to the Talk Film Society Network. You'll be able to hear Oh, yes, the Valentine's Day episode of Monsters Never Die. Uh, Eat your heart out. We're doing Hannibal Lecter, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Really looking forward to doing that one. And maybe over the summer you'll hear me on a new show, possibly called Shut Up, Nerd, uh, with Matt and Johnny, uh, where we talk sci-fi movies, and that should be a lot of fun. Sounds great. Can't wait to hear it. Uh, on that note, uh, you know, we want to, uh, you know, plug our Rinky Dink operation. You can find us at Cinema Number Two Letter on places like Instagram, uh, Blue Sky, whatever hell site you use, they're all out there. Um, and you can uh, find me specifically on places like Letterboxd, at Not The Who's Tommy. And I also do some uh, writing uh, at MarianiThomas.wordpress.com and at film credcom And I'm also still kind of on Twitter every once in a while um, at B-R-Y-A-N-D-R-A-D-E and the number three uh, but I'm also on Letterboxd as well at my name uh, where as Matt said lists are fun and making lists are. is just so much fun and I'm, I'm making fun. a bunch of lists over there so yeah follow me on there and uh, for more of uh, us you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts uh, if you're listening on Talk Home Society, you want to listen to all the other great shows, like Matt's show or any other ones. Uh, you were just great on the Talk Home Society podcast. That was Matt. a fun one. Yeah. Yes. Uh, talking about a fish called Wanda with Marcelo. Uh, a such a good movie. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, you can also dig into our archives and our Podbean main feed for, you know, all the earlier seasons of this show and the old Double Edge, Double Bill stuff we used to do. Uh, you can uh, find it all there. And, uh, you know, if you can't support us on the Patreon, that's cool. Money can be tight. But the free way to help us out is to just rate, review, or simply share the show around to give us more visibility. Make sure that we're not caught in the patina of shit. <laughs> but on that note, we'll at least tease our next episode, our finale for the 1-1 Oscar season. We always end our seasons on an A for Atypical Choice. And uh, this time we're going with... Rango, the 2011 oh. Best Animated Feature winner. Nah. <laughs> Are you a fan, Matt? <laughs> it might be my favorite Western. <laughs> oh. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> it might be. Like, it's a tie between that and Unforgiven, which is really weird, oh, but Unforgiven whatever. Is, no, Unforgiven is definitely up there for me. I mean, similar oh. movies, so Clinton, both of them, kind of. Kind of, yeah. So works. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Fuck you, John Wayne. Um. 
<laughs> but yeah, I'm curious to talk about this one, Brian, especially for an animated feature when it definitely feels atypical. Yeah, I was, I, I, I mean, we'll talk about this next week, of course, but I was looking at what else was nominated in 2011 for Best Animated Movie, and it's a very weird category, and it's it's interesting that Rango won, and as we'll get to it, it's kind of a movie that, much like Michael Clayton, but for very different reasons, would not get made today. Nope. Um, no. And it's such a strange movie, so I can't wait to talk about that. And I want to see Rubinsky. the behind-the-scenes Rango, because they shot it all live. I've seen clips oh, of that. And yes. use that yeah. for reference. Yes. Like, I want to see that. That, I think it's shot really by Roger cool. Deakins as well. Is that, is that, is that true? That's... If it is, that's insane. <laughs> <laughs> Great for yeah, an animated sh- film. Even in the animation. He just, he just comes in. He's like, yeah, I'll shoot your uh, your reference footage. Why not? <laughs> Give me a camera. <laughs> it is. So, yeah. He's he's credited as cinematography consultant. Yep. So uh-huh. that's wild. <laughs> yes. We'll, we'll talk about, you know, that. Best animated feature. Gore Verbinski. All that next time. But until then, everybody, uh, you know, we're just going to, like, leave in this cab. You know what? I just I just got to I gotta get the fuck out of here. Give me $50 worth. Just keep driving. Just drive. <laughs>